Before Kim and I had kids, and we lived in Pennsylvania, we went for a hike to a place called Glenonoco Falls. I've got a picture of it right here, a couple pictures actually. You see it's a very beautiful waterfall. Uh, at the very top of the mountain, the water literally bubbles up right out of the ground in a little tiny trickle, and it turns into this and ultimately makes its way down to the Lehigh River below. But as you get to the trailhead for this hike, you're greeted with this sign. The sign says, Warning, hike at your own risk. Wear proper shoes. Hikers have been killed and injured. Not only do you see this sign, but as you go up the trail, you see more signs like this one. Danger. Skull and, I mean, skull and cross, crossbones. Stay on the trail. Warning. I mean, it's all up this trail. And these are not just be careful signs that the Park Service put up. They put these up for a reason, because since 1970, about a dozen people have been killed at this waterfall, and countless others had been injured when they ventured off into areas they weren't supposed to. When people stayed on the trail, there usually wasn't a problem. But as you'll see from the next picture, people like to venture out onto the falls. At one point, they actually put up chains to tell people, don't go past this point. But as you can see, people do anyway. And the problem, though, is once they got out onto that, into the falls, the rocks were covered with algae, extremely slick. And there was a, oftentimes about a 60-foot drop to the bottom. So a slip could be fatal, much also to extremely high risk for being injured. But in 2019, the Park, Service, they, the Park Service actually closed this trail down. However, in 2022, despite the fact that the trail was closed, a 76-year-old woman was hiking the trail illegally with a group, and she fell to her death. I saw an article in the Philadelphia Inquirer about that woman, and someone who was interviewed says, you can put up a fence, but people will either climb over it or tear it down. I share this story as we are nearing the end of Hosea, because like the people who chose to ignore these warning signs and the barriers for the falls, Israel has continued to ignore God's warnings to turn back to him, and they have gone beyond the barriers of the law that God had established to keep them safe and keep them within, focused on him. Today in chapter 13, we will see God's final judgment against the people of Ephraim in the northern kingdom. The people have been warned and warned and warned. You've been through this. They've been warning, it seems like, warned every week. But they still are not turning back to God. Ultimately, in this chapter, we see a foreshadowing of what will be Israel's final fate, or Israel's fate. Like we saw last week, Hosea will once again point back to history at a time in, in Israel's history to remind them of God's faithfulness and show the people that what they are doing here in this context is wrong. Last week in chapter 12, Hosea rem reminded the people of God's faithfulness in the wilderness, and he also reminded them of God's faithfulness to Jacob and Moses despite their sinful nature and desire to do things their own way. Today, in chapter 13, God is going to point back to a time when Israel, um, when, when their ancestors were in the wilderness. He's going to remind them that you were not faithful to me then, even though I provided. He's also going to point back to a time before they had earthly kings and, say, and said, I was your king, but yet you chose to follow them instead. I'm just going to let you know, today's text is, is quite heavy. Um, I'm going to address some of the things. I'm not going to necessarily go verse by verse, but we're going to take a look at it all because it's here. But my prayer for today is that we won't be immune because of such the harsh words, harsh words but that we will see and be reminded of God's goodness, his faithfulness, and his mercy in our own lives. So I'll read our text today. If you haven't turned there, obviously, it's Hosea chapter 13, and then I will pray. 
When Ephraim spoke, there was trembling. He was exalted in Israel, but he incurred guilt through Baal and died. And now they sin more and more and make for themselves metal images, idols skillfully made of their silver, all of them the work of craftsmen. It is said of them, those who offer human sacrifice kiss calves. Therefore they shall be like the morning mist, or like the dew that early goes away, like the chaff that swirls from the threshing floor, or like smoke from a window. But I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. You know no God but me, and besides me there is no Savior. It was I who knew you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. But when they had grazed, they became full. They were filled, and their heart was lifted up. Therefore, they forgot me. So I am to them like a lion, like a leopard. I will lurk beside the way. I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs. I will tear open their breast. And there I will devour them like a lion, as a wild beast would rip them open. He destroys you, O Israel, for you are against me, against your helper, Where now is your king to save you in all your cities? Where are all your rulers, those of whom you said, Give me a king and princes? I gave you a king in my anger, and I took him away in my wrath. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is kept in store. The pangs of childbirth come for him, but he is an unwise son. For at the right time he does not present himself at the opening of the womb. Shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? Shall I redeem them from death? O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion is hidden from my eyes. Though he may flourish among his brothers, the east wind, the wind of the Lord shall come, rising from the wilderness, and his fountain shall dry up. His spring shall be parched. It shall strip his treasury of every precious thing. Samaria shall bear her guilt because she has rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword, their little ones shall be dashed in pieces, and their pregnant women ripped open. Let's pray. God, you are good. And as we sang this morning, we are reminded that you are our solid rock. It is on you that we can confidently stand. And Lord, I just ask that you be with us this morning. Lord, I I trust that you have prepared the exact words for your people this morning. And Lord, I just ask that the Spirit is actively engaged in hearing what it is that you want us to hear. Help us to be reminded of your goodness and your mercy and your love for us. We ask this in your name. Amen. So chapter 13 is actually broken up into two sections. Uh, Verse 1 through 9 we see the ramifications of Israel continuing to serve man-made idols. And then in verses 10 to 16, we see the cause and effect of Israel choosing to reject God as their Savior. Verse 1 through 9 starts out by giving us an indication that things must have been going pretty well for Ephraim. I mean, at some point when Ephraim spoke, people listened. Despite the possible prosperity or status that they were experiencing, the charge against them is that they worship Baal more and more. They make more and more handcrafted idols and even engage in human sacrifice. Things appear to be going well for them, per their standards, but they continue to serve gods more and more. So they're doing okay, so they keep serving other gods more and more. Ultimately, they are rejecting the God who has given them all this goodness. Because of this, God warns Ephraim of the looming destruction in verse 3 by using the images of the morning mist or dew, chaff on a threshing floor, and smoke dissipating from a window. They will not remain. In verse 4, Hosea begins the first history lesson, reminded the people again that He is the one who brought them out of Egypt, and that they know no God but him. If you recall from the historical context of Ephraim, Jeroboam, one of the kings, 
told the people of Ephraim that it was the golden calves that he set up that was the gods that brought them out of Egypt. God is trying, though, to, to remind them that, or is telling them that that is in direct contradiction to the law that he handed down through Moses. The first thing he tells them before he hands down the law is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. In verse 5 and 6, God reminds Ephraim that he knew their ancestors when they were in the wilderness. He wasn't just with them, but he knew them. If you stop, stop to think about the reality of the situation and the history of the Israelites, God knew in advance that his people would turn from them and that they would reject him, yet he rescued them out of Egypt anyway. He knew they would follow other gods, yet he was in covenant with them. He rescued them despite their desire to turn from him. So we see an indictment in verse 6. When they had grazed, they became full. Therefore, they forgot me. With the previous mention of the wilderness, my thoughts went back to the time period between the Exodus and God handing down the law. God gave them freedom from slavery, and they forgot him. If you go and look at Exodus 7 through 18, you will see example after example of how God protected and provided for his people, even though they complained the whole way. And they forgot about the goodness that God gave them. The Hebrews at the time had witnessed God's heavy hand over Egypt with the ten plagues, and then witnessed with their own eyes him part the Red Sea as they walked across. Once in the wilderness, they ran into bitter water at Marah, and so God told Moses, throw a log in it and it'll become sweet, and it did. Next we see where God provided enough bread from heaven for them to eat in the middle of the desert, yet they complained. And next we see where the people were thirsty and had nothing to drink. So Moses tapped a rock and water came out. And then lastly, we see where God prevailed against them when they were attacked by Amalek. But things kind of start to take a real turn southward right as as Moses goes up to receive the law. If you skip ahead to Exodus 32, we see where the people become anxious because Moses is up on the mountain talking to God too long. It was at that point where the people had forgotten about God. They gathered up all their gold and had Aaron melt it down to form a golden calf. And he told them, these are the gods that brought you out of Egypt. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that what Jeroboam is telling these people? Forgetting about God And propping up false gods is the exact thing that Ephraim is guilty of. So in his judgment, God tells the people that he will be like a lion to them. He uses the images of a lion, a leopard, and a mama bear with cubs as a warning to them. You know, when I was a kid, I used to love watching shows on the Discovery Channel about animals, specifically predators. We didn't have cable, so my grandmother used to tape them for me, and I would just watch them over and over again. I mean, the lions in the Sahara, how they hunted in packs, definitely didn't want to go there and experience it. But, you know, these are all dangerous animals when they're not treated with respect. From the safety of binoculars or from TV, they're fine. But if you get too close or you get in between a mama bear and her cubs, they're going to respond the way wild animals do. God demands the same respect from them and us, though. He is like a roaring lion, and because Ephraim is not respecting the boundaries of the law, nor responding to his warnings to return to him, they are teetering on the brink of destruction. So the first section of chapter 13, the people have ignored warnings, they have stepped over the barriers, of the law, but things seem to have been going okay for them. But now, at this point, they're standing on the edge of a 60-foot cliff covered with slick algae, and they don't even realize that one more step could be fatal. 
What they failed to comprehend is that God would save them if they just turned around and asked. So now we transition into the second half of chapter 13, where God uses another moment in history to compare what's happening then to what's happening now and why they are wrong. The judgment against them in verse 10 is that they have replaced God with their kings. In verse 9, God describes himself as their helper. But because they have turned against their helper, the text says, He destroys you, O Israel. He asks them, Where are your kings? They cannot save you in your cities. This is a foreshadowing of what will soon come when the Assyrians invade. And Israel's earthly kings will not be able to protect the cities or the people. The earthly kings that they had asked for and that they put into place. But only God can be their savior. This takes us to history lesson number two in verse 11. The text says, I gave you a king in my anger and I took him away in my wrath. God is pointing them back to the time of the prophet Samuel before they had kings. Samuel had appointed his sons to become judges, but the elders did not like that. They wanted a king instead. So you can read about this in 1 Samuel 8. But God comes to Samuel and he, and he says, go ahead, give him a king. It's not because they're rejecting you, but it's because they're rejecting me. But before Samuel gave them a king, God instructs him to warn them about what a king will do. And so in 1 Samuel 8, you can read that Samuel tells the people that an earthly king will not be in your best interest. They will rob from you, and they will lead you astray. The character of an earthly king will be in direct contrast to their true king, God, who doesn't rob, but he provides, who won't lead them astray, but he will shepherd God is righteous and holy, but an earthly king is not. Despite the warning, though, the people still demand a king. So in his anger, God gave them one. Maybe you can remember a time in your life, potentially as a child, where your parent was frustrated with you because you were asking for something, and they knew that whatever it is you wanted wouldn't be good for you, but they let you do it anyway because they wanted you to learn from your mistake. The problem here, though, is Ephraim didn't learn from their mistake. God told them not to establish kings, but they did it anyway. Now we, here we are years later, and they are continuing to worship the kings that they're putting in place. And in verse, thing, verse 13, God points out that that decision is fatal. But in verse 14, God tells them, I have the power to save you. He is offering a way of return, but their eyes and their hearts are postured towards the kings. Samuel told their ancestors that the day would, soon, would one day come where they would cry out to him, but he would not answer. And now that day is almost here. God gave him the kings. God gave him the prosperity in the land. God loved his people. God has the power to save but his protection for them will soon run out. The text says the east wind will come. The east is, direction, is the direction that their kings had turned to towards Assyria for political protection. And it's from the east that Assyria will come to rob them of the good things that God allowed them to build up, all while turning further and further away from him. You can read about the reasons for the destruction in 2 Kings 17. But I want to read 2 Kings 17, 12 to 14. It says, And they served idols, of which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes, in accordance with all the law that I commanded your fathers, and that I, spent, that I sent to you by my servants the prophets. But they would not listen, but were stubborn born as their fathers had been, who did not believe in the Lord their God. God has warned and warned and warned, 
We've come to a time where there are no more warnings. Ephraim has rejected their Savior, the only king who can save them. But despite the continual warnings and being turned away from God, the words in the first sentence of verse 14 are just dripping with God's mercy. If you have the ESV, you see this as a question. Shall I, re- shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? But if you take a look in the King James, the NIV, the CSB, and many other translations, this is actually a statement. It says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. The people are standing on the edge of the cliff because they have rejected the warning signs all while slapping God in the face. Yet he says to them, I will ransom you. Isn't that what Christ did for us on the cross? The Assyrians eventually overtake the cities and the buildings that the people had built up. They seized the metal and carved images that the people had made. The kings are destroyed, and Ephraim is ripped from the land. The land God gave them, the land that brought them goodness and prosperity. However, Ephraim cherished those things more than the God who gave them those things. All things that, when times were good, they propped up. When the, Assyrian, when the Assyrians invade, yes, it was brutal for many of the people that lived there. And unlike the image of the lion, the leopard, and the bear, and, uh, the, the words in verse 16 most likely are not image. Assyria was a very barbaric nation. When the east wind came, there was carnage. But 2 Kings tells us that the Assyrians did not kill everyone. They took the people captive and scattered them all over the Assyrian Empire. They were taken away from their idols. I couldn't help but think about a relationship between a parent and a child if a child is addicted to drugs. I recently watched a documentary, a documentary on opioids in the U.S., and they followed a, a father and daughter who the daughter had become addicted to pain medications after a very routine surgery. The father tried and tried and tried to get help for the daughter, but that addiction to the pain meds eventually turned into an addiction to heroin. And then the father learned about this thing called fentanyl and how it was extremely deadly. So in a last-ditch effort, the father sends his daughter away to get help with the hope that one day he would return to her clean. He removes her from that temptation. And in the process, he cuts, the, he severs the ties of that drug and that temptation that were fatal if she had taken the wrong thing. The only reason God saves some of the people who did nothing to deserve to be saved is because the good father made a covenant with his children. He made that covenant fully aware that they would hear and ignore his warnings, they would step over the boundaries of the law, and that they would be standing on the edge of a fatal cliff. He loved them, and he wanted to be united with them again someday. So that's what's going on in the text here. I'll be honest with you, I spent a lot of time wrestling over the application, because I think it's, it's tempting to say, well, we need to strip ourselves of our idols. And while that's true, I don't know that that's necessarily the point of this text. But something that kept coming up in my mind over and over again is, are we really any different? I'm not saying that we bow down to carved idols and worship other gods. But if that is something that you struggle with, or maybe you're purposely turning your back on God, then I hope you hear this as lovingly as I can say it. You're standing on the edge of a cliff. I pray that the Spirit will convict your heart to turn to Him. And if maybe you're feeling a heavy weight right now, it's likely that God is calling to you saying, turn around. But I want you to know this. Be reminded of what Romans 8, 1 says. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God knows us. There's nothing that we can do to surprise Him. He's standing there saying, turn to me. But when I say, are we any different, what I mean is that we are prone to wander. 
I mean, just this morning, this is ridiculous. We were praying before breakfast, and we had the World Cup on in the background. Well, the announcers got all excited, and I'm praying, but I'm thinking, oh, no, are they going to score? Like, that's how easy it is to wander. Yes, Israel is guilty of idol worship and following earthly kings, but what God is trying to show them here is that they have forgotten about his goodness, and that and that has manifested itself in idol worship and following other earthly kings. But how often do we wander? All the time. At least I do. I do think it's important to realize how easily we can wander towards potential idols in our lives. But I fear giving a list of possible idols can draw us away from the point of what God is trying to tell Israel and, and tell us. And sometimes trying to focus on the idol in an effort to get rid of it can become an idol, and it takes our mind away from the God who can save us from those idols. But don't, don't not hear me, though. We do need to be on guard, but we need to focus on God. I'd like to try to explain what I, what I have been thinking just with a, an illustration, and I pray that this makes sense. But all of my life... I've had a garden. I honestly don't remember a time when we didn't. You know, my parents or even a couple of pots outside of the apartment balcony, we had something. I mean, we need food. There's nothing wrong with gardening. It's fun. Adam and Eve were born in a garden, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Growing a garden can also build community with the people around you. Terry and I had a competition this year to see who could have the first tomato. I asked her, she said I could say that. She's in the nursery, so feel free to ask her who won. <laughs> but, you know, since it's a hobby of mine, I tend to watch and read other people who garden and homestead and all that kind of thing. And one thing that I've noticed since about 2020 is people who garden and have farm and, you know, whatever, something that they did out of enjoyment or just to grow their own food has now turned into something that they do out of fear. They fear that, well, we saw what happened in 2020, so now we have to do this ourselves. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with growing your own food, but what they fail to realize, I've completely lost myself in the notes, um, what they fail to realize is that God is the one who provides it all. So we grow it. God is the one who tells the seed when to germinate. God is the one who brings the rain. God is the one who tells the bee when to come to the flower to pollinate. He's the one who decides how big the cucumber is going to be. What God wants from us is our heart. He wants us not to look at something that we do or that he's given us and saying, oh, look what I've done. He wants us to turn to him and say, God, thank you. You did this. We just happen to be the tools that did it. So can gardening become an idol? Certainly. But we have, to be, we have to remember to thank God and understand that he is the one who provides. It can be so, it can be so easy to wander, especially if we see success in a certain area. He wants us to turn to him and say, God, thank you. I think that is a healthy and fearful respect for the sovereign God. He is a roaring lion who demands our respect. He provides and he can take away. As C.S. Lewis says about Aslan, he's not safe, but he is good. But how do we do this? How do we keep God in front and center of our lives and not forget about his goodness? My second point of this is this. We need God's help. There's no way that we can do this on our own. I mean, I got distracted just praying for breakfast this morning with a soccer game on in the background. God told Israel in verse 9 that he was their helper. And that truth still applies today. What we should be doing, instead of focusing on not having idols is we should be dropping to our knees and asking God to help us remember about his faithfulness and his goodness to us and trust that he will. 
If our heart is aligned with God, I believe he will reveal areas in our lives that we need to turn loose of so that we can grip him a little tighter. And again, remember Romans 8.1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We don't need to be ashamed if God reveals idols in our lives. The good father is not angry or wrathful towards his children. He wants nothing more than for us to turn to him and say, God, I need your help. In the same way God knew his children in the wilderness and he knew their desire to turn from him when he brought them out of Egypt, Christ knew us when he laid down on the cross to have nails driven into his hands. He knew about our struggles. He knew every single idol that would catch our eye. And he knew that we would be prone to wander. But out of love and devotion to his children, he took God's wrath meant for sin so that when we find ourselves venturing to the edge of the cliff, we can confidently turn to him and he will be there with loving arms. But there's one last application, and it's crucial and it's foundational for our faith. Verse 14 says, O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where is your sting? These words may sound familiar. We read them in the New Testament reading. We're going to sing about them in a minute. But Paul takes these words and he applies them to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15. They too are struggling with idol worship and pagan practices. But they're also struggling with the reality of whether or not the resurrection was true. Paul lays out the truth that Christ died for our sins and he rose on the third day according to, uh, according to the scriptures. But as proof that when he rose, but, but as proof that he was alive and that he rose, he appeared to over 500 people before he ascended back into heaven. Paul goes on to tell the Corinthians that if it weren't for the resurrection, all this Jesus following would be for nothing. It would be pointless. The resurrection is the foundational moment in Scripture that everything else hinges on. It was at that moment that death was defeated. The promise made in the garden to crush the head of the serpent was fulfilled the moment Christ became alive, victorious over sin and death. That's why we can call him our solid rock. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to 57, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So our charge is to remember the resurrection the goodness of the resurrection. God told the people to remember his goodness in the wilderness, and we are charged with remembering the fact that he died and he rose. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Let's pray. Father, I admit that I don't always dwell on your goodness. And I'm sure that many of us here could say the same thing. Lord, I thank you, though, that you knew that before you formed us. You knew that we would stray. You knew that we would wander. You knew that we would seek worldly things over you. But, Lord, we also know that you died for that. And we can confidently turn to you today because you are alive and say, God, help me. Help me to stay focused on you. And I trust and I know that you will. Amen.